light too. Uh, so maybe it's hard to spot the ones that are there. That's always a question. Mm -hmm. whether I, can't, I can't hear you, Larry. It's always what? a question as to whether... Um, if, I guess if the... St I think they're referring to the sea stars if they avoid light. I don't think they can move all that fast, can they? Yeah, I don't think they can move that fast. Uh, there are some species of sea stars that do. Um, but I haven't really seen any sea stars. Well, that's not true. I've seen brittle stars, which are a little different. I've seen them respond to our ROVs, whether that's from the light or vibrations from the ROV moving around them. We actually have seen ophiroids quite a few times jump off or fall off of corals oh. um, in response yeah. to the ROV's presence. But those are much smaller in size com in comparison to the uh, sea stars we're seeing here. Okay, we've just passed 1,000 meters, so we've come up 412 meters and have another about 200 meters to go. Yeah, All I, right. think that, I think that was the question was where the fish avoiding the light. And I don't yeah, know. yeah, just reading that. Yeah, and, and yeah they definitely can avoid the light a lot easier. Right. And, um, uh, I suspect that's a good question because many of these fish really never accounted, uh, encountered light before if they're from deep areas like this. Wow, that's cool, Peter. Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> now it's not the road, now it's the wall. Um, we have a question that says, in your undersea explorations, are you doing anything like a species count per fixed area uh, to determine growth or decline of populations or species diversity? Or is that difficult to achieve as you folks are likely the first down here with an ROV? Well, that's a, that's a great question because this is a lot of what Ignacio's thesis is about. We're not the first. We're actually intentionally repeating a dive that was made in, was it 2011? Mm. Um, by the Okeanos uh, Explorer, and so Ignacio, who's from the University of Puerto Rico, and I'll let him speak in a minute. Yeah, uh, yeah, so we're, um, by doing this dive, we're creating uh, right, a I'm sort of timestamp for the future, so... Free H bridge um, add another 20. We are essentially taking a s uh, survey of the species distribution and abundance. Um, hopefully we can compare that to the 2011 data. And in the future, whenever we do come back, um, hopefully me, but uh, I know the future people doing ROV dives will be able to use my data and the previous data to see how how much has changed. I guess more, is crannoid still the most abundant <laughs> species uh, <laughs> between the eight to 1400 uh, meter um, radiant? So again, that's one of the really nice things about being able to do this 3D photogrammetry is that we can preserve all that information and, and put in the time to look at that uh, zonation of, of species and diversity gradients up and down this slope. And that was one of the you know, primary drivers of, of choosing this slope is you know, hoping to see some of those distinct transitions from different communities, uh, just as we saw those, those corals really cropping up around, uh, I think it was 1,000 to 1,100 meters. Um, hopefully we'll see some exciting things. Um, we're uh, getting closer to the top of this ridge, so uh, we're really uh, hoping that'll be some exciting uh, rock outcrops with, uh, with corals and other things growing on top too, but uh, we won't know until we get there. Yeah, that's always the most exciting part of any hike, and especially with this ROV uh, hike as well, is getting to the top and seeing what's up there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to peel off of that one, Larry, and come back to the south a little. Oh. Sure. 20 meters off to the north there of our track.
So for those of you just joining us, we are um, at almost a thousand meters depth and we are looking at these rock formations. We saw lots of dikes and uh, organisms living on them and so we're mapping out this Wait area. Or yep. for age, for age now. Collecting video meters, footage. Two seven zero. The dikes are gone. <laughs> oh, they may come back. Sort of an interesting little rubble field here, though. You see everything sort yeah. of, any of the slightly bigger rocks, things are latched on and doing their thing. Yeah. I'm looking at our sonar, right? Looks like there might be some interesting features coming up soon, though. Oh. Ooh. What? <laughs> <laughs> so you can't you can't show your excitement while you're on mute, Jonathan. Oh. You have to Am unmute on yourself. Mute? I'm not on mute. No, well, you were, were you? Oh, oh. It didn't come over SPL a little while ago. Oh yeah, look at all these rocks. <laughs> How cool. <laughs> What did, uh, what did carbon-14 say to nitrogen-14? <laughs> uh, no? Okay, I'm waiting. If you're listening, submit your answers on nautiluslive.org. <laughs> <laughs> what did the carbon-14 say to the nitrogen-14? Uh, maybe something that Carbon dating? I don't know. Oh, was that close? Yeah, was that you really close? <laughs> you want to go on a date? I don't where, know. Where have you been all my life? Oh, 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 oh wow. That's a good one. How about that for a highlight? Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan Audio highlight. Dad jokes. Grown. Yeah, significantly highlight. more dad jokes when Jonathan's in. The <laughs> yeah. Usually you wait until about 2 o'clock in the morning to get this punch drunk, but here we go. <laughs> uh, What's that? Is that a but do you remember any of the uh, cat packs from yesterday? Cat packs. You know cats have to blink three times? <laughs> to blink once? Was that cat pack? Yeah, three yeah. eyelids. So, All right, well, we found some cool. Yeah, that looks pretty interesting. Yeah, I think that might be a Chrysogorgia bottle brush, but yeah. it looked a little bit different. I'm not sure. I caught it just as it was going off screen. Biology really loves the corners of these dikes, just over and over, repeated. Good turbulent flow there for feeding. Looks like there's also a uh, relicanth today, anemone there, that dark purple pom pom looking. Oh, uh, yeah, second one we've seen. Yeah, second one I've seen. Yeah, same. I've seen, I think, yeah, oh, two yeah, or three. I, I missed it. it was, it was in the corner there. All right, I'm going to go ahead and do another move. Sure. Bridge, bridge now, 20 meters, 270. You're going west, I'm going north. All right, that's fine. You'll come <laughs> west eventually. Yeah, well, <laughs> one way or another. So I am super curious how this photogrammetry is going to turn out because out of all the scenarios that I had handed mind when designing and looking at the system and preparing the you dive. You've never had a ridge like this. Yeah. yeah. 
going along a knife sharp ridge yeah. is not, <laughs> yeah. not one of them. No. Because <laughs> you you know when you're doing wits work you you have to you set all of your parameters. What are the angles of the cameras? Everything before you dive, and it's not like we can just pop these ROVs back up and and change. No, we're pretty committed to this at this point. <laughs> yeah, we're we're a hundred percent. But I, I think I think that the fisheye lenses being so far apart and canted we'll, we'll out should provide a yeah, pretty a, good a great, a great test for it. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see that on the triclops, those two little insets on satellite feed three, how they that kind of warp kind of reaches over on either side of that yeah. that edge. So hopefully for a lot of these features we'll be able to, to actually reconstruct all the way around. All the way around, yeah. That would be amazing. And it's a balance of you know, we could see more if the ROV was a little higher off of the ridge, but then the water clarity and the color and the contrast goes down because you're peering through too much water, so. I keep having this strange sensation. There's no way a biologist would let me fly the ROV this fast. <laughs> they would be just crying, slow down, slow down, slow down. You may go faster if you would like. Really? Yeah. I had thought I was moving way too fast. That's the really cool thing with this technology. Yeah. Is we can you know, go faster, see more, and then slow it way down later. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, I often get to come in and do dinner relief, and I usually then drive it like I stole it. And, uh, on the last expedition, we had geologists on that particular watch, and they didn't weren't bothered with any of the uh, fauna, and so that watch moved a lot faster, covered a lot more ground. Then we did on our watch where we had what two or three biologists, three biologists, Taylor and yeah, I so believe we so. Could, we would make like 50 meters in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop, stop and zoom, zoom at everything. Zoom. You good for another move, Dan? <laughs> yep. Bridge, bridge, nav, uh, another two zero, two seven zero. It's weird how the dikes run uh, with the bathymetry looking how it is. We're generally going uphill to the west, but the dikes run north and south. Does that make any sense? To Say again? Well, what, what, what would make sense is there are sills, not dikes. <laughs> so they were now quite you're quiet, horizontally. Right. You must have the microphone far away from you. I don't. <laughs> Can you hear me at all? Now I can hear it, you. It's very low, uh, but I don't know. Is it just me that thinks that Larry's volume is low? Same. Okay. Uh, this is the quietest I've ever heard Larry. Well, he before, everyone was saying it was too loud. He's gone from a megaphone yeah, to a whisper. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, um, if, if the dikes are all running north-south, yeah. and uphill is west, well, general uphill. Yeah, yeah. Immediate no, I uphills. See, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I can see it on the map. Yeah. It may be that what these are not are not dikes, but they're more sills, which are horizontally in place uh, layers. Oh. Uh -huh. Ooh, look at big white coral. Whoa, yeah, it's a big one. Let's do it. 
Full spin. Yeah. Roger. <laughs> Serious? What? Serious. Yeah, yes, of course. yes, <laughs> absolutely. Look how much tether you got. Yeah. Uh, maybe actually this would be a great moment for a nice considered laser shot before we do it and a well, nice log if we're going to do it for real. It's so yep. funny because it looks like it's back. It's a good idea. You know? It's nice, yeah. This is quite nice. There's a lot of good biology around there. I'll have to wait for the boat anyways to get above me. I can't, I don't have enough leash to spin right now. I'll put uh, Atlanta right above us, so continue the move there. All right, continue the move. Uh, bridge, bridge well, down. Could. Did Add another just 20 meters. We Focus can get on a, the rocks uh, and the yeah. biologist on the coral. Yeah. <laughs> we can get a, here. each their own. Is we'll there a squat, car, a squat lobster there too? Yeah. I'll get a, uh, oh. a beauty shot and a zoom a fish? here while we're waiting that for shrimp? the ship. All right. Shrimp. It's very beautiful. Wow. Uh, uh, no, don't zoom yet, video. Go ahead. I'm my, still, you. still miles away. <laughs> I'm going to turn on the down lights here while we do the zoom. Wow. That is a beautiful shot. I am highlighting. Nice. Can you uh, come down five meters? I'm just looking at the rock. I like that shrimp, though. I know. <laughs> Look at this big thing. Everyone finds their own beauty in it. Yeah, this coral is gonna look great in virtual reality. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, you can uh, go for a zoom there. Da, 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 da. Yeah, one of the viewers wrote in that Larry is being very quiet from time to time. <laughs> Um, and somebody asked, do these critters know the rock that they attach to uh, is, is stuck, or do they just hope that the rock is not going to roll downhill? I don't know. <laughs> they probably hope it'll stay there a while. Perfect. That's yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's one they've way to got find out. a better out. chance of it than <laughs> on the sediment, that's for sure. A lot of organisms mm -hmm. do have wow. sediment cues uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that you can use their sort of olfactory yeah, senses right. to see, like, does this smell like a place that, that other corals are at? And if so, maybe that's a good place for me to be also. I'm going to take this moment yeah. to pause the recording so, and we're going to check some settings. Um, okay. Roger. Yeah, that could certainly help with, with settling uh, cues no, no, for, for certain organisms. and. Here. Once one is there, it might attract others as sort of a, a place where, where life is happening, so a good place to be. Um, but yeah, a lot of these things, like uh, if sort of you're in any like coastal environment, like if, and you look around at rocks and tide pools, you'll often see things sort of all over it pretty randomly. So yeah, <laughs> things settle and like, okay, this seems good and uh, time will tell. Oh, look at that l little squat lobster. Very cool. Hey Dan, give me a give me a one minute warning before you move the ROV. I'm just checking some settings right now since we have the moment of pause here. Roger. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you can uh, go wide video and you can you can uh, come up now. Right, thank you. <laughs> you can come right up kind of rapidly. Good there. Uh, you're up above the loop in the tether, so then come up another five for me. Uh, we are, uh, we're close enough now to do the spin, Jonathan, so okay. whenever, whenever you're ready. Give him a second. Half a second. Might as well take the moment to. Let's 
Okay. Come up another five, maybe. Okay. Ready? All right, yep. Dan. Just, Give uh, it a spin. Good, full spins. Good distance away here. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, here we go. And I can do it like totally fast, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're listening from uh, online, we're doing a full spin uh, of this coral here. Uh, taking advantage of our, our 3D photogrammetry system to get every angle uh, of this large coral and associated biota so that uh, if we see everything with the cameras, then we can stitch it together and create a fully 3D model uh, of this coral in our computers to get a, a better look at it uh, after the fact. And so that's a big theme of what we're doing here is reconstructing the seafloor and these occasional kind of tours around objects to get yeah. all the different angles. Can't spin any more that way. Not can and, to um, <laughs> really help to help us to see behind behind things and make sure we're, we're not uh, missing anything in the shadows. Yep. That was as far as you could go, I guess. Well, yeah, there's a mountain there. Yeah. <laughs> Did we uh, get any lasers for uh, scale on this? No, uh, I can before we leave. Good point. Yeah, you saw the camera bump. That was uh, when the uh, back of the ROV is hitting the rocks there. Oh, it's been the other way. Solid. As long as, uh... My dust cloud. Oh, we have a question about squat lobsters. Um, are they more closely related to lobsters or to crabs Bonk. or hermit crabs? As far as I can go that way, I can come up a little, but I don't know if it'll be in your cameras. So. Taylor Ann, do you know the answer? I'm to still, that? I still, we still have it in the fish eye. Uh, Bonk. Bonk. Um, I can look up the taxonomy for you really quick. Okay. Nope, I'm hitting in the back there. Can't we do tried. It. We tried. That's uh, yeah, it's on a hill, so it's all you get. If I come around and wipe the BSR off in the hill, I get a quick we'll laser on it before we uh, lose we'll be it. done. That's good. There we go. I also spun too fast and dusted it up. I should know better. Nice. Okay, great. Good. Happy, happy? Yep. Always happy. Thank you, Dan. My All pleasure. Right. Okay. I guess this time we can say upward and... Hmm. Upward and onward. And onward. onward. That's what happens when you spin really fast by a hill. I like get so. a 3D <laughs> model of my dust cloud. Well, we can reconstruct that cloud. <laughs> that yeah. would be cool. That's called pilot air yeah. cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like uh, squat lobsters are an infraorder anamura, which is uh, lots of hermit crabs. Yeah, uh, somebody just wrote in, despite being called squat lobsters, they're actually crabs. Yeah, they're more closely related to hermit crabs, according to National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they certainly look like hermit crabs without their shell. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the disruptor lights off there. Are those just the forwards now, or is it forwards and mids? Forwards and mids. But f forwards are still um, headlights, and mids are almost headlights. Cool. Just down enough to uh, light the Zeus up here. I'd say next time we do this, all we need to do is just fill that little black void on the on the starboard camera. All right, I'm right going to get another move rolling. No? No, we're going to do a, we're getting close to hand over here. Okay, gonna, just I want to do a, uh, a static ship not moving, winch not moving. Okay. Uh, do a good hand over here with Simon. And yep. Just uh, explain to him the nervous nelliness I had the first uh, half hour, so maybe he won't have to go through the same thing. Uh, you want to bring your head back around to the west for us, please?
I'm going to, uh, it might take me a few more minutes, so I'm going to, uh, we have the ship stopped here, so I'm going to take advantage of that, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to sign off and um, just go through with Simon what I got here with the layouts and uh, different options he has, because he will probably want something different, and just okay. make sure he's okay with everything. That sounds good. All right. Thank you, everyone. That thank was you, a Dan. Lot of fun. Thanks, Dan. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. So we're gonna we're up on a shift change right now. I'm gonna stop recording as well. Okay. Thanks for watching Roger. and continue watching, because the next shift is coming on in a few minutes. Rachel?
we're going through a watch shift now, uh, change over watch, so it takes about 10 minutes or so as uh, each person from the last watch briefs the oncoming person. So for the, for the next few minutes, you won't hear a lot of chatter from either the front row or the back row as uh, people are preparing the next watch for what they have coming up. At the same time, though, feel free to drop those questions in the chat, and uh, we can uh, see those on the other side of this uh, shift change. So keep answering any questions you might have as we're exploring this uh, ridge. And
right, is everyone situated from watch change? And maybe we can do a round of introductions. Just to let you know, the uh, front row is still getting situated here. We got some uh, training going on, but feel free to go through in the back. Okay, we'll start off with the back row first. I'll start off with myself. Hi, I'm Daniela Griffey. I'm a high school teacher at Radford High School. I teach marine biology and AP environmental science, and uh, my school is located on the island of Oahu, really close to Pearl Harbor. Um, and before becoming a teacher, I worked as a marine biologist for 10 years, doing mostly fisheries biology work, did some um, consulting work over in Australia as well. So. I'm excited to be back out on the sea and do some field work again. Um, we'll pass it on along the line. Um, do you want to take it over? All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm here in the data logger position. Um, and yeah, I'll be here through the whole watch, just keeping track of all the the cool and new things we see. Um, I'm a grad student here, actually, on the island of Hawaii, just where we're outside of. Uh, I live over on the Hilo side, where my work focuses on using remote underwater video systems uh, for observing our reefs. So excited to be here, taking cameras much deeper, um, and seeing all this technology work. It's been quite an amazing thing so far, and yeah, excited for the rest of this dive. All right, well, Jonathan, I know you've been here nonstop, but you want to introduce for any of our new viewers tuning in right now? Yeah, uh, my name is Jonathan Feely. I'm our media producer uh, for the Ocean Exploration Trust and uh, cinematographer and the systems designer for this uh, three camera wide field camera array, AKA Triclops. You'll keep hearing us refer to it as Triclops because it is this three camera unit. You can see it in sat feed one right now. It's a, a pair of 180 degree lenses that together form a stereo pair. So you get a 3D, 270 degree view around you. And uh, the center of the camera there is uh, just a really beautiful cinematography uh, camera. Um, it's recording at 6K, we've passed 4K and we're just, we went straight on to six with Nautilus. Um, and combined together, they uh, produce an absolutely incredible immersive image uh, if shot as a traditional film. And uh, for this particular dive and for most of the dives during this expedition, um, we've put them in an array that uh, really maximizes the capacity of the system to produce 3D models of objects we see. It's a program called uh, photogrammetry or a process called photogrammetry. Uh, which relies on the parallax, so um, how you, how light and um, uh, how movement. Uh, I'm sorry, I got out of it. You can Google parallax. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering that. It's, you keep, you keep bringing the relation, up the word parallax. I'm like, I have no idea what so that if is. You, if you if you close, if you look in the there world you with your two eyes, you can see stereo. You can see 3D, right? So if you're at home, you can look at something far away. And if you have things that are closer to you, they're a little bit out of focus, but you can focus on those close things and every, the world looks at 3D. Now, if you close one eye, the world suddenly becomes less 3D, right? You, you don't have an extra frame of reference to tell distance. But if you move your head very slightly to the left and the right, you have parallax. Objects that are closer to your eye are moving more than objects that are further from you. Um, and that allows you to perceive depth again. Um, so it's that same degree of parallax, the relative movement of objects in a frame of image that allows us to calculate, or I mean allows an algorithm to calculate um, the 3D structure of an object as we're moving over it. Um, and that's why having three cameras is better than having just one. Um, it provides more data points, more parallax as we're, we're traveling over the ocean floor to be able to collect photogram uh, very accurate models of the seafloor around us. Um, so that's it, that's Triclops, that's the purpose of this dive other than um, observing and going back over some pretty incredible sites um, that were surveyed a long time ago. All right, thank you, Jonathan. All right, Dan, would you like to go next? Sure, I'm Dan Dietz I'm from the Office of Research. Uh, I'm the watch lead for this uh, next four hours here as we explore up the rest of this slope. 
Um, looking forward to seeing as the corals increase and change in diversity and species. And hopefully we find the pinnacles at the top here. So we're going to explore the ridge line once we reach the top of this uh, seamount. Yes, I'm very excited for that yeah, as well. So we're seeing no guarantees, but you know, they didn't find it the last time we were down, but we're going to look for it. Maybe we have the better, better luck. luck. <laughs> All right, Travis, we'll shoot it on over to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Courtney. Uh, I'm assistant professor in the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayaguez. And yep, I'm here with a graduate student, Ignacio Rueda, and, and we're really interested in uh, gradients of uh, ecological communities across uh, depth. And so that's part of why on this cruise today, we started at the bottom of this little seamount and we're climbing to the top using our photogrammetry along the way to develop models and record everything. And we're going to bring that back with us uh, to Puerto Rico to uh, analyze and figure out what's going on with shifts in, in communities, why things live where they are. Uh, so, yeah, really excited for that. Grateful for Ocean Exploration Trust and the Office of Naval Research for the opportunity to join on this cruise. Travis, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like a career path-wise as someone wants to get into research, get into working for a university? What does that career path look like? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the the biggest thing, I think, is just ask. Uh, when I was in my first year in uh, my undergraduate studies at the University of North Carolina, I kn knew that I was really excited about marine science, and so I went door to door and said like, hi, I'm really interested. I want to get involved. Um, what opportunities are available? And thankfully someone said yes. <laughs> and so, you know, they opened that door and then, uh, yeah, I worked really hard and tried to learn as much as I could and um, <laughs> keep learning and keep finding new opportunities. And so, uh, you know, I think really following your curiosity and, and asking questions and and you know, asking for opportunities is, is the way to go. What was like your first research project you did, your first independent research? Yeah, so my first research project was actually as an undergrad student. Uh, I had some experience in working with marine aquariums uh, at a pet store in high school, actually. And so um, when I started working for my undergraduate research advisor, um, Dr. Justin Reese, uh, he was really excited because he's like, okay, you know how to keep things alive in aquariums, like go for it. Um, we were doing ocean acidification experiments at the time. And so we grew uh, tropical sea urchins from the Florida Keys, mm -hmm. uh, different seawater mm -hmm. temperatures and uh, CO2 concentrations to sort of mimic uh, sort of mean conditions that might be experienced in summer and winter uh, under normal and acidified conditions to see how fast they grew. And, and then we sort of had a follow-up looking at changes in their, their skeleton composition uh, to try to make sort of a, a thermometer that we could use in the geologic record from sea urchin spines. Very cool. I'm just going to step in there. This is Renato Kane, navigator in the front row. Um, before we go through with our, continue with our introductions, I'm just going to check in on the back row with everything and uh, give everybody a status update. So right now, we're approaching waypoint five on our way up this slope, which generally trends uh, west upwards. We have um, approximately until we get to the top of the ridge from where we are right now, we've got about 600 meters. Um, right now, the Triclops, Triclops camera was just power cycled, and I'm just waiting for uh, Jonathan's word on uh, when he's good to go there, and we can start to get uh, moving or, or otherwise follow the directions of uh, what you'd like to do there in the back row. Yep, systems are nominal and uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, great, uh, good to hear. Um, so, uh, Simon, we're facing roughly roughly upslope. I you know it looks slanted in front of us right now, but like the, the main trend of it will be west. Um, so if, if you like, I can uh, go forward with a 20 meter step. Yeah, cover that, yeah. Good, uh, good to go. Sounds good. Bridge, nav. All right, yep. can we step two zero meters, uh, bearing... Is that? Sorry, stand by. What's two zero meters, bearing 275. 
that a gulper eel? Thank you. It looks like it. In the, there's a what might be a gulper eel in the right hand fish eye, which would be below ROV. Uh, right. Okay, yeah, I see yeah, it in the right hand fish eye. Yeah, oh, there just, it is. Just oh, coming into view right there. Wow, that does look like a gulper. Is that a gulper eel? It does look yeah. like one. Should I? Let's see if we can. Uh, you recording down there? I got to record on so that. So, this is kind of how this three lens system helps oh, us because we wow. only saw that in that one lens. Oh my this gosh, is it's a gulper eel. Pretty it spectacular. Is, cool. These are very rarely imaged. Uh, we imaged one in Papanaumokuakea back in 2018, and we saw the jaw open. Um, so wow. This is, this yeah, oh, this wow. is pretty incredible. Are we outside, able to get a, right? a zoom on this if we're stable here? Yeah, absolutely. So if I remember correctly, Gulf of Year is having the So they have an the extended outside. mouth. They have this extended mouth. It's one of our cool deep sea adaptations that really allows, because food sources are limited wow. here. So they have this and really then, big mouth and their stomach can extend that they can eat things three times their size. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Uh, wow. Is that gulping? Hey, video, do you want to go for a zoom? So Copy jo that. Jonathan, have we only seen this one time before? Uh, I've seen little baby ones, yeah. but uh, that highlight that we're referring to yeah. uh, uh, is truly one of the most spectacular things. I, I love I use that one all the time. I've showed it to my classes back in Hawaii. Yeah, that, that's the that behavior that we saw back in 2018 was uh, similar to what we're seeing right now, where uh, the the kind of mouth pouch was uh, was was kind of filled like this, and then the behavior that we saw, where it actually opened its jaws kind and then like uh, and closed and kind of went back into more the more svelte gulper eel, gulper eel form. Really um, awesome. What, uh, what's our, was the first time that it was filmed. What's our complement of lights at this point? Because I'm uh, wide open and okay, still right to that. Just underexposed. Um, yeah, we just got the upper's mids and uh, the starboard, port and starboard lights on. Do you want the, the only other ones it's I have? Up, the it's down, up to Jonathan. I'm not, I'm not down light. driving the ship. Yeah, that's that. going to wash it out a little, I think. That's okay. Uh, we, weren't, we weren't expecting to film gulper eels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, whoever saw that, that's a really good eye. Very uh, cool. That was Jonathan's spot, I believe. <laughs> yeah, this and it's extra cameras. I had extra camera. That's a beautiful view, though. Yeah, yeah, being able to pick that up in the silhouette was uh, pretty impressive there. Yeah, we yeah. still we still could use some more lights uh, on the front of her. That's, all, that's all we got, except for down. Uh, down's not doing yeah. us any good. Yeah, yeah that's, so. I mean, that's a full complement other than the downs right okay. now. Okay, all right. Uh, geez, it's, uh, we uh, we do have some forward there. Um, Atalanta is on the move, so you're, yeah. you're uh, do that. I'm uh, wide open right now, so copy that. Cool. Jonathan, I got to be honest. Uh, when you said gulp reel, I was like, yeah, everyone would like to see a gulp <laughs> reel right now. I'm sure you see a gulp <laughs> reel in your camera, but you were right. <laughs> it's the triangle with the the little pokey bit on the back yeah. end. I mean, super distinct, <laughs> hard to miss, huh? Really amazing. Wow. Outstanding. Yeah, those jaws that you're seeing. Oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, it's yeah, opening yeah. right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's gulping. And now it's gone oh. back to its streamlined position. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. Amazing. That ship move is complete. Atalanta has moved uh, a little bit, but not. Uh, it probably still has a little more in the bank. Um, but we're fine as far as the uh, terrain goes. Oh, Jeff. In the two fisheye lenses, this is an impossibly small dot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to see. Oh, we're really cool, though. But the fisheyes are what picked it up in the first place. Yeah, so. pros and cons. Yeah. Oh, little guy. I would say we're good to move on. Yeah. All right, we have um, someone in the chat saying that the cameras are fantastic and he was a merchant seaman working on the RV Gyre and other vessels. So uh, giving a shout out because he's been watching ever since the pandemic. Nice. Thanks, man. Well, you just got a gulper eel. That's a rarity. <laughs> rare. 
Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. If we can, I just messed up all my camera settings oh. to be able to get that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to need just a half a second of a pause facing the slope just so I can refocus the cameras. Copy that. Thank you, sir. Are you Work. happy with this position? Are you? Uh, if you can lower down to about maybe five meters off or, or relatively close and facing the slope, that would be great. Yeah, copy that. Once again, you never know what the sea is going to bring you. Yeah. Never know. You just got to keep your eyes out. Good, good start to the watch. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Dave, Dave, you brought the luck, Dave. Okay, next uh, it'll be a uh, Dumbo octopus. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take the, the gulper eel any day. That's that's the second one I've ever seen. That's, a, that's really, the really first, first for me. Yeah, so, they're yeah. really pretty rare to get any footage uh, of that. I was thinking more CQ numbers. <laughs> I'll take I'll take CQ numbers any day. With full rotation, let's make sure we get those in oh, photogrammetry. There um, so I have a question. This one was asked back when we were doing our shift change, but they're asking if the ridge is as steep as it looks. So do we know the angle on that steep? Yeah, so the, the resolution that we have from our multi-beam sonar, that's how we uh, have data uh, on the seafloor, is a lot lower so um, than when we get down here at the bottom. So oftentimes some of the steepness is, is um, kind of uh, dulled. So I know the general trend of the slope and general trend of this ridge here. Uh, but when we come down, oftentimes there can be blocks of steps Just a little and further down, and can, uh, Steve, if you can, please. A little closer to that rock with uh, sure. framing up uh, that cinema cam. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so that steepness will be variable. Uh, the general trend of this slope um, was something around 25 to 30 degrees. Um, but here you can see in front of us, we've got something that's a little more wall-like. Um, and that'll, that'll occur in, in steps as we go up. Thank you for that. Sure. We've been seeing a lot of that today also, just sort of this steps with the various dike formations cutting through uh, this overall general sloping area. Uh, okay. So we'll see if that continues as we move up. Okay. Um, I am ready to begin. Okay. So we'll continue on. Um, Simon, whenever you're ready, I can call in another ship move forward. Otherwise, I'll just uh, maintain here. Yeah, copy that. Let's uh, start heading off. Sure. And uh, just began data recording again. Just starting? Yep. Uh, same set, uh, settings are, we're doing uh, DNGs every three seconds. This is at one, 120th of a second. Okay. Auto ISO. Did you get the call for your Got it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And that's for all three triclops, yeah? Yeah, that's correct, yep. Okay. And uh, Simon, I'll still continue on that um, for now, that 275. Uh, 275, right 275, right and uh, it's up between you so and TJ how you'd like Gulper to Ireland, uh, Gulper control Eel Atalanta's 6K, heading, huh? um, whether you wanted to Haven't keep it 275 and you move around in there, or whether you'd like to have him follow you and just knowing that our trend may be in a different, really, really a different direction. Really yeah. Um, yeah. But if you're right, I'll call in that move. Watch out. Bridge now. Can we step two zero meters bearing two seven five? Thank you. Here's another question that was asked right around shift change. Um, so when it, while exploring at these depths, have you guys ever found a geological feature that you had not expected, like a cliff or a cave that was not indicated by the LIDAR or sonar screening? Uh, I'd, I say sure all the time, um, really. That, that resolution that I was mentioning earlier, 
uh, can yield a lot of surprises. So in shallower water, we'll, we'll have higher resolution from our shipboard multi-beam, but uh, oftentimes we're in deep water. And, uh, you know, truly, uh, I, we, we can we can take a guess at what that's going to look like when we get down there. And we've been surprised all the time when I've expected some sheer uh, kind of cliffs. It's a it's kind of like a mudslide. And other times it'll be, um, I'm you know, I'm expecting a flat muddy bottom and it's a, a lava flow. So. So yeah, we're at a thousand meters. So I, I would say you know the resolution, each pixel that you see is probably close to 50 meters by 50 meters. So cave entrances, pinnacles, that type of stuff just doesn't show up. Okay. Or, you know, when you're this deep. Yeah. Like you said, when you're shallow, you get much higher resolution. And when they're diving much deeper, you know, down to 6,000 meters, those are my 400 meter pixels. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because the how far the sound has to travel and come back. So you can hide a couple big city blocks in the 400 meters. Very cool. So Jonathan, this one I think is more geared towards you. People are complaining that the footage on the gulper eel was um, very blurry. And I think is that mostly because our <laughs> settings were, you're talking that this camera is not Ouch. meant to. Yeah. Anonymous, oh no. <laughs> Dave's over there going like, well, if I had real lights, it wouldn't have been blurry. <laughs> it is true though, no, uh, it was awesome to see, but uh, you know, this is a very specialized camera system that's meant to do survey work pointed down at, uh, at a slope like this. And um, earlier on, we were discussing how challenging it can be. You, you have to set these cameras up before you know what's down below you. Uh, just like Rennie was saying, like sometimes you're expecting mud and you find lava. Sometimes there's lava and, and uh, you're expecting cliffs. Um, so we've and set up. Sometimes we get a gulper reel. And sometimes you get a gulper reel. So like we had reconfigured the lighting in this instance so that we could maximize our coverage of the seafloor with these two fisheye lenses, uh, specifically for the purpose of doing uh, rapid photogrammetry as we move through. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, TJ. So yeah, unfortunately, that gulper eel was not uh, as as beautiful as it could have been because the lighting had been changed. So uh, to no fault of our awesome video engineering team here, um, it has to do with uh, where light goes and uh, how it interacts with the camera as it's being bounced back. Dave, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. We're, uh, we're secondary on this uh, operation. Yeah. Yeah, 20 meters. Yeah, so we can we can trend to the uh, we can trend to the right and see if there's if it's just this slope or if there's any um, any kind of uh, feature. All right, Jonathan. They say it's not all on you. The feed has. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it, and I'm sure uh, that will at least make a part of a highlight like reel. If I know um, our fantastic editorial right. team back at home watching this, we. I'm pretty sure that it was, it was yeah. highlighted multiple times. It was. I highlighted it three times, and I put it at a five. <laughs> yeah. On the right of uh, fish eye, it looks like there's something there. Huh? Yeah, the top right fish eye. Yeah, cool fit. Right next cool to the feature. Claw. Yeah, well, it was moving. Oh. I think oh, it's Oh, it is moving. Oh, there's like a schmoo. What is a that? Schmoo? That right eye is just picking up all yeah. the cool stuff. I think we have like a. Is that triclops. That's uh, some debris. It, is it stuck on the lens? Rogers. Can we. Um, can Zeus see. That area of the top right, there's some biological. It looks kinda, like a jellyfish got stuck maybe, on it. Could be a sea cucumber. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Just to clarify, you'd like uh, you'd like Hercules to to pan oh right. Is that I right, Jonathan? Yes, please, and wide. I'm trying to see. There's like a. There's something floating around. I think yeah. it's a sea cucumber stuck to the lens. <laughs> It's oh yeah, it does they're, appear they're to be. They're attacking you, yeah. Jonathan. He's looking in that Triclops camera on the top. You see, there's a little floaty little bit. Oh yeah, next to the yeah. Is that is that on the lens? I look. It looks like it. It looks like a sea cucumber on the lens or something. Hmm. You need windshield wipers. Well, Ignacio, mm -hmm. that's gonna. It's really gonna 
spice up the photogrammetry workflow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we all know how much you love uh, sea cucumbers. Yeah, so. I, think they, I think it's all your fault. They're coming for you. Yeah. It was Ignacio's way of saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. He's oh, just wow. hanging out there. I can't see it. It looks like it's got some, some little legs though, or something on it. Are we sure that's not on? No, that's definitely on the lens. Oh, no. It's coming down farther. Um, <laughs> Turn to Steve, do you think on. we could, yeah, yeah, do you think we could kind of wiggle back and forth and shake see if off. he shake them off? Is that so, uh, you, you'd like Simon to try to shake? Yeah, yes. back and forth? yeah, Simon, if you could, please. Just like a dog. Anyone want to sing some Taylor Swift? Yeah, Taylor Swift comes back. <laughs> Oh, it's sticky. <laughs> it's not coming off. Oh, no. Oh, he's hanging on. It's making him go tighter. Uh, I don't know. It seems like it's it's got a chance of coming off. <laughs> this, is, this is a highlight reel right here. I sh <laughs> Should oh, I no. highlight? The highlight. <laughs> Everyone would be like, why are you highlighting this? What's going on? <laughs> I'm just, and I'm just time-lapsing this. It's going to be just a, oh well. What is he stuck on? I think he's on the lens. I can't see, yeah, it doesn't, I can't see it from this angle. Oh, okay, well, uh, we're wasting time. I can mask him out. Okay. Um, Thank you. Atalanta, were you spun around because you were tugged or? Oh, Roger. Okay. Are we sure it's not Roger, a Roger. Um, okay. Are you, I'm not uh, sure, but I think Simon? So. You like to keep pr I progressing? Think sure. Bridge nav. It's already the same if we just move one back. more step. Maybe two zero meters, yeah, bearing two right. seven five. I don't. Thank you. I think confirmed. you're just being tugged, I think, at this point. It might be just uh, at the end of the tether. So, yeah, Roger. After all that shaking business. <laughs> I would say continue on. Yeah. Up the slope. Yep. Roger that. Yeah, we just called in a ship move. Um, we were halted there for a moment. Um, and uh, once Atalanta gets moving, we'll be, we'll be all right. calling the um, our sea cucumber stuck on our lens a blooper reel worthy. <laughs> I think we should put in the Hercules dancing too, trying to get it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shake it off. Uh, see, it comes back to Taylor Swift again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor Swift seems to be the theme for this expedition. There we go. Now we're all back, back sorted. Got about 10 more meters to go on the move at the surface. Atalanta's probably got 15. Open to finishing introductions for the first row? Sure, I think it's a good moment for that. Okay. 
Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm Renato Kane. I'm the navigator on this watch. Uh, I've been sailing on Nautilus for um, about 10 or so years now. And I also do um, seafloor mapping as well. You can go ahead, Simon. Uh, sitting in the pilot chair, I'm Simon. Um, 17 years ROV experience, but this is my first trip on Nautilus. Hi, Simon. And he's doing great so far. Simon, do you want to tell us about some of your previous experience, your other ones before Nautilus? So, for the first 13 years of my ROV career, I was um, working in the oil and gas industry, doing subsea construction and inspection, maintenance, repair. Uh, moved into science three years ago. Um, done some jobs in the Pacific doing um, surveys of pelagic and gelatinous life okay. uh, around the Clarenton Clipperton zone and some work for Ocean Networks Canada and some work for Departments of Fisheries and Oceans this year also. I was also involved in the Titanic Titan sub rescue earlier this year. Oh, awesome. So, If someone's interested in becoming an ROV pilot, what would you say are some techniques or skills that would they would need to get into that field? Um, it's a very multidisciplinary um, kind of field, so I'd say be open to open to learn, open to experience mechanical, hydraulic, fiber optic video, uh, the piloting aspect of it. As previously mentioned yesterday, I believe you know a good spatial awareness and imagination of what your surroundings are and um, yeah it, it's it's a hugely interesting rewarding career we see some incredible things do some incredible things um, I feel extremely lucky to be here it's uh, a career that kind of chose me and uh, yeah I'm very happy to be here um, engineering experience from any from any walk of life can be applied pretty much to, to ROV. Um, but yeah, just someone who's open-minded and interesting in learning all aspects of the technical side of things, as well as the piloting. I definitely have terrible spatial awareness. <laughs> and so I don't mm -hmm. think I'd, and whenever I try video games, I'm always the one driving the car off the road. <laughs> I can drive, but not, not video game driving. So I think I'll stick to teaching. <laughs> Called in another step there as we as we continue. Yeah, Roger that. TJ's turn. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, TJ Scanlon uh, from the southwest of Ireland. Uh, similar to Simon, uh, offshore oil and gas. Uh, past 15, 20 years that way. Um, yeah, uh, came here in Nautilus, coming up on a year ago now. Uh, I've. Uh, multi-disciplinary uh, tasks I would say I'm a deck chief and uh, Atlanta pilot and uh, enjoying every day it's great over to you Dave <laughs> hi I'm Dave Robertson I'm the uh, video engineer on this uh, watch uh, on Nautilus now since 2016 uh, I also have a career that chose me in oceanography I come from a television broadcast background 45 years in the uh, television broadcast industry. I've uh, uh, des designed and built TV stations of all sizes from large uh, million dollar, multi-million dollar facilities, uh, net network affiliates, uh, down to small systems like this, and even smaller systems. Uh, that's what I do, I design and I build TV stations of various sizes. You, um, could you explain a little bit more exactly, I, I feel like a lot of times students think like video engineering means taking videos, but it's way more complex than that. Do you yeah, think you I'm, the, I'm the last guy that you want to give a camera to. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't shoot, I don't edit, uh, I don't produce, uh, but I have been around all of that my whole career. Uh, I've done live news, I've done live sports. Uh, in the off season, I work for ESPN, CBS Sports, Fox Sports. Uh, I do sports productions, basketball, football, hockey, baseball, whatever season it is. Uh, since uh, my off season is the winter time, I generally do uh, uh, hockey and basketball. Um, yeah, video engineering is designing and building the system, maintaining the system so that it uh, continues to work, 
uh, and that involves uh, from the camera uh, through to a distribution network, which we have here in the van, out to monitors so it can be seen, to recorders so it can be recorded, uh, so that those files then can be tr uh, transferred to storage, saved, broadcast by satellite. I'm also a satellite engineer, uh, and uh, uh, I've been doing it for a long time. I got into oceanography uh, when I was uh, the uh, chief engineer of the campus TV station at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, they have their own ship, uh, the uh, Thompson. Uh, I was asked to uh, consult with the oceanography department uh, on a new camera to put on uh, an ROV. It was an HD camera. It was the first times that that was done. Uh, I did the first uh, HD over IP uh, live satellite link from a ship at sea uh, ever. And uh, that was in 2005. So I, that was the first time I'd ever been on an oceanography ship uh, before, and I've uh, been doing it ever since. Nice. Can you, like, I've always been interested. Can you talk about the evolution of video, especially in the deep sea? Because, like, I remember as a kid, you know, like the giant squid was always like this mythical thing. We'd see it white wash up every once in a while. And then just through my lifespan, we finally got the first video of it or pictures of it. And now videos and it's just the video of being able to take video underwater and deep sea has just, that technology has just grown so much so quickly lately. Right, well like all technology, uh, it, it gets better, faster, smaller, uh, cheaper, that kind of stuff. But it really all goes back to uh, uh, Bob Ballard, uh, who uh, uh, started the, the Nautilus, formed OET uh, for this kind of stuff, because uh, he said instead of sending people down in subs to look through windows, let's send cameras down to look while we have more people watch it up here. And the whole telepresence idea was born. That was really Bob's idea, and he's the one that drove it. Uh, and so it's all had to, it's all had to do with uh, uh, cameras that were small enough, light enough to get uh, into uh, uh, or onto a vehicle to go down, uh, withstand the pressures, have it be in a pressure bottle that could stand, and then uh, transmission to get it back up here on fiber is what we use now, uh, that kind of thing. So it's just the, uh, the evolution of, of, of technology. It gets, uh, it gets smaller and, and uh, easier to use. And then uh, in 2005, uh, standard definition analog cameras were still uh, pretty much being used. Uh, on most everything, uh, when we put an HD camera on uh, on uh, ROV for the first time, uh, that was also Bob Ballard, uh, and uh, and then I was doing the same thing at the University of Washington at about the same time in 2005. So, well, you have a comment in the chat right now. They're saying that want you to fix the compression and say you can just snap your fingers or something, right? Um, <laughs> it's all about bandwidth. And bandwidth equals uh, equals money. It's expensive to run the satellite uplink, uh, and so uh, we're we're uh, we are compressing the, the signals to get them ashore. But we have a limited amount of bandwidth uh, to do that in. Uh, that technology has improved greatly too since the early days of MPEG-2, uh, and we're now using more sophisticated uh, codecs uh, to get a better signal. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, what we're doing now uh, wouldn't wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't have been possible. Wouldn't have been imagined. We, maybe 10 years ago, we would have done one stream. And 15, 18 years ago, when I first did uh, a live HD stream, uh, it was one stream using MPEG-2 compression. Uh, well, and that was right on the hairy edge. Me doing my um, interactions, like talking to schools in Greece, it's like amazing that there's no delay at all. So yeah. it's, it's there's, a, there's a little bit of delay, but, uh, but not it's as... It's not uh, noticeable, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very, it's very impressive. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's all part of a big team that uh, that OET's put together. I'm just a little little cog in that uh, in that wheel, but uh, it's a lot of fun to do. He's this a big cog in the wheel. <laughs> this is my this is my second career. I'm actually retired from the broadcast industry, and then this is what I do. This is my retirement gig. So I come out here and do this. When I'm on shore, I'm retired. How many expeditions of the year are you on? Uh, about half of them. Half of them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, six or so. Uh, I also work uh, on other ships. Uh, I've worked with Simon uh, on, on other ships uh, as well, uh, you know, with other ROVs, uh, that kind of stuff. I get, I run a consulting business and I get called up. Sometimes I get called up to just do a video system for them or add an HD layer 
to their video system or add a 4K layer to their video system, uh, different recording, that kind of stuff, and maybe mobilize that onto a ship, train people to use it, but not sail. I've done that as well. So, yeah, it's very, uh, it's a lot of fun. I get to meet a lot of really interesting people, like all of you, <laughs> and uh, do uh, really interesting stuff, like what we're doing now. He's selling himself short. When I mean, first met him, he did an incredible job for first time I'd ever worked with a video engineer on an ROV, and hugely impressive. And, uh, Some of it comes from uh, understanding, uh, having you know done it a few times, and understanding what it is that an ROV does, and how it works, and how the systems work, and what the pilot expects, and uh, and what the scientists expect, uh, and that kind of stuff. And so that's uh, uh, knowledge that I uh, tend to bring to the to the table so but thank you Simon I do appreciate <laughs> it and how much light more light right more <laughs> <laughs> if you ask the video engineer about the light he will always mm. say more oh. Oh. yeah yep. it's a phrase I still carry around with me. <laughs> <laughs> my legacy it is I'm going to keep us moving along here. Yeah, I'm happy. Bridge yeah. now. Can we step 30 meters bearing 270? Thank you. Following our, uh, our track here as we head a little more westward. Is Jonathan back there? Um, he was in the studio, but I don't think he's oh, okay. in there anymore now. Sorry, just making sure he's all good. <laughs> Aside from walking around cursing that cucumber. Yeah, we still have our 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 hitchhiker. Slinker, our hitchhiker, yeah, yeah, still with us. See, biologically, we're seeing some coral here that, um, just coming out of the screen on the right-hand side. Those red uh, blobs are the mushroom coral. Been seeing some crinoids here and there. Looks like we got a sponge coming up. Travis, do you have a, a wish list or like something of like your ultimate like deep sea animal you'd wish you could see? Oh, that's a, bucket, a good question. Bucket list. Hmm. The coral bucket list. What's that? The coral bucket a, list. A coral the bucket, coral bucket <laughs> list. Yes, there's, the, there's of course we want to see like <laughs> as many of the big corals as possible, but it's hard to ignore the, the stunning uh, uh, videos of the things like whales that we saw <laughs> on, on previous headline. That's really exciting. Um, but for today, what I'd really like to see is, you know, get up to the top of this ridge and see a really interesting rocky feature just covered in corals. That would be, that would be really cool. So we'll see. We have a couple hundred meters to go. Zach, how about you? Do you have a, a bucket list deep sea creatures, creatures you'd like to see? I mean, oh, can you hear me? No, move your mic up. There we go. Honestly, uh, Gulper, Eel, Gulper Eel was definitely up there. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe seeing all the that. highlights we've had in years, that was <laughs> one where, yeah, you don't see that much anywhere, even like, you know other people observing or anything. So that was one um, I didn't expect, but you know, of course, hoping for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoy seeing cephalopods. So if we could see, you know, some squid or some octopus, yeah. I, I definitely enjoy I that too. That. I've been keeping my my eye out. Um, here in Hawaii, they call it the taco eye because taco is the, the word they use, right? Yes, now. it it's is. It's actually from Japan, but um, they use that here for octopus. In, and we Hawaiian, always joke. in Hawaiian, it's hey, hey. Yeah, hey, hey. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, always trying to practice the taco eye, and if we can practice it at depth, that's even more fun. <laughs> David, 
Dan, how about you? You've been on a lot of these. What's your What's your bucket list? Oh, I'm always a mammal guy. Yeah. So okay. Dolphins, whales, you know, uh, sea lions, you yeah. know, that type of stuff are always, you know. Have you ever Have you ever seen a monk seal like coming around? Maybe when I Hercules is coming up. No. Mm, but that would be nice. That would be nice. You know. Yeah. Monk seals are hard to come by anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you see them. It's great. But I on this expedition, I just like to see some really nice big corals. Yeah. I had um, an interaction this morning, and we had some students say that we need a Nautilus mascot. Like, and I was like, oh, I don't think we could keep a Nautilus alive in a tank, but maybe we need to get a stuffed Nautilus, a stuffed animal Nautilus for the ship or something. I agree. There was that slop here. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That slow-mo on that duty. That slow-mo, yeah. <laughs> the earlier watch. I don't, I don't us. think um, that's not official all Nautilus. his that's students not. would appreciate <laughs> slow-mo being left behind, though, when she has to get off the ship, so. <laughs> It's a temporary mascot. It's a temporary well, mascot <laughs> for Expedition 156 yeah. mascot. <laughs> hmm. Noticing our DVL isn't tracking along. Let me fix that. Our US bail has been good enough, but might as well have both. There we go. So I noticed the geology is changing from, you know, the previous watch. Yeah. A bunch of, you know, you can clearly see lava flows and this, and this looks like a much older lava flow to me than the newer ones we saw down there. Yeah, we don't have those columns anymore no. coming up. And the ice cream sandwich, that's what the previous watch was calling them, right? Yeah. And that, that bit. hard substrate seems to be what the corals like. Yeah. This seems more silty. More silty, more rubble. Yeah. Yeah, less less prominent features, although on screen coming up there. Looks like we're coming back into coral land. Well, I just you know, once again you have to realize how much the environment makes a difference when we look for these corals. So it is really sandy and, and muddy and they just don't like to grow there. So yeah. when we see these barren places you gotta think why. Yeah. I was uh on the coral front, I was recently up in Labrador on the uh on the Amundsen at what they call the Hanging Gardens of Makovic and the Paragorgia and other corals growing on the vertical cliffs, wow. which is pretty uh, unusual apparently. Wow. So it was, but they were everywhere. We had something pretty, pretty special. I think it was near Jarvis um, where we had, well, first it was, it was two things we saw. <laughs> uh, one was blue coral, which was really just, I mean, I've never seen Is that, that before. And then another was uh, these corals that were hanging upside down. Upside down. Yeah. They were growing upside down in, in kind of an overhang. It was really, Ooh. really special. So it's, it looks like it's like slithering. Some, some coral to bioluminesce. Mm. And it was, uh, yeah, take the sample oh, of it yeah. and shake it Is with the lights off. At two o'clock, we got a little yeah. little thing slithering along the bottom. Sorry, that eel there? Yeah, that, looks that eel like yeah. there. Did you want to take a look at it a little more? I think it's a little off track for the photogrammetry, but oh, okay. they just stepped out, so <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. That's all right. We still have the Herc Zeus camera. Um, Can we see what it is? Bridge nav. Three zero meters bearing two seven zero. Thank you. Thank you. We're seeing some of this blockiness again here. It looks like um, kind of the slope up to our, up to our, on our starboard side. Um, it's pr pretty significant. We can see it in Atalanta's sonar. We're well clear of it. We're 20 meters away, but, um, but it's pretty nice. Uh, might be nice stuff to look at as we move along. Uh, I just added our DVL track back in, so. We've been using DVL the whole time, but the track length wasn't very long, so now hopefully we'll be able to draw off of that a little bit. Is that a fish? 
Uh, yeah. yeah, like nine o'clock or so. Looks like one. Yeah. Is that a fish on the it, left hand side? It looks like it. It almost looks a little bit like the. Uh, The goose fish that we oh, saw yeah. earlier. There we go. Yeah. Is that, that another goose fish? That looks like another goose fish. I always think it, they look funny. A fish with legs. Yeah. So, Dave, uh, what do we have going out over satellite? Is it still Hercules Argus, and then is Channel 3 this... Um, this photogrammetry setup? Yes, that's okay. correct. So what is this like our third goose fish for this expedition? I'm not sure. We may have seen the one twice. The one? Same one twice. Same, okay. It was in the exact same, same spot. Oh, okay. They're, they want a, people want a close up of the goose fish in the chat. Is there a way to zoom in? Stand by, I'll just get it in a good place in the frame here. Close up. Your call, Simon. I can zoom in any time. Sure. Go for it. Does anyone know why it has those protrusions on it? Is it just for sensory, uh, more sensory organs? Not sure. That is a great question. Uh -huh. All right, Simon, if you could trend uh, north as as we move west here, just to get okay. kind of up uh, in front of Atalanta. And yeah, we can all I think we need thank to you. Move up here in a second. If everyone's happy with the yep, the goose fish. Get you up slope, and then we'll be able to bring Atalanta um, up a little bit as uh, this terrain comes here. Travis and Ignacio, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the adaptations corals have in the deep versus like what we're normal normally used to seeing? Like, you know, you see these pictures of all these beautiful hydro corals from the Great Barrier Reef or in the shallower zones, but. Um, how are the corals down here different? Yeah, so one of the biggest differences is the mode of feeding. Um, typically in shallow reef environments, they are, are more autotrophic, which means they um, use sunlight to create energy to build their car, uh, calcium carbonate skeleton. And they do this with the help of a mutualistic symbiosis with zooxanthellae. That's that one of my favorite words. I try and tell kids to say it, it makes you sound smart. Yeah, right? It's almost like a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, and so those, um, those little symbionts live within the uh, yeah, coral right. tissue, and it's actually what provides the color for the coral itself. And so if ever you see an image of like a coral bleaching, that's because the symbionts have been um, expelled and you're seeing the actual skeletal structure um, of the coral. But, um, and so yeah, mostly they will be autotrophic and 
in the deep sea, they're more heterotrophic, which means they actually actively feed. Uh, so it's like one of the major differences, and also um, the skeletal structure is also very different too. I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Travis can correct me that in a deeper, they, uh, in a deeper ocean, they use more of a, uh, it's a chitin, almost like the skeletal structure of insects. Your, your also your nails, right? Chitin your nails? Uh, or no, that's keratin. That's keratin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Travis, how do I do? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, as Ignacio was saying too, like a lot of the corals we've seen on screen today are, are white uh, because they don't have those colorful symbiotic algae with them. And a lot of the corals here are also what we would call soft corals in sort of general terms. And so instead of building this really firm, uh, completely calcium carbonate skeleton, they sort of have a mix of minerals with them. Uh, and so they can sort of have like flow in the, the current a little bit. You also notice that in the sort of overall morphology, so the shape of the corals themselves, when you're thinking about things in, uh, for example, the Great Barrier Reef, we have really big, massive colonies forming huge chunks of rock, whereas the corals that we've been seeing today, for example, here in the deep sea, uh, they have uh, sort of spindly uh, little skeletons that sort of fan out. And this sort of highlights some of the differences between the two. So in, in the shallow zone, you want to be really big and sturdy so that you can uh, withstand wave energy and sort of hog as much space on the bottom as possible so that you get all the light. Whereas here in the deep sea, uh, it's really quite the opposite because there's not a lot of, uh, not as much of that really turbulent flow from waves breaking and there's no light to com compete for. Uh, so they're really trying to be uh, kind of spanned out and catching as many of the particles as possible so that they can get the food that they need. And their main food source is the marine snow, is that correct? Yeah, so sinking food. Most of the food's coming from the surface, from those phytoplankton and zooplankton, and that's sort of sprinkling down and reaching the sea floor. Zach, you got a shout out in the, the chat. So they say, um, shout out to Zach T from the Big Island, Gold Vulcan, Shaka. Yeah. <laughs> I got it all there. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. another viewer is talking about how what amazes them is that animals are still able to find themselves in darkness to mate and saying hello from um, Burlington, Ontario, Canada. So I, a lot of these animals have some really cool deep sea adaptations to be able to mate. A lot of our deep sea animals can be, um, um, they like uh, angler fish, you have parasitic males where the male will, is actually a lot smaller than the females and they'll just latch on to the first female. So you can get multiple males onto a female at the same time. Um, and then a lot of the, our deep sea critters are also both males and females to increase their odds as well. And some have like, uh, I know the big scale fish has really big nostrils to help them s smell male or their opposite mates and stuff like that. So it is really cool, the different adaptations they have to find mates. I think we've seen um, some behavior where the, uh, uh, the male crab of some of the some of these deep sea crabs will actually grab the female and carry them around until they're ready to mate. Yeah. Seems to be a something Cop that we've observed before. Copepods do that, don't they? Mm. The males will or the females will latch onto a male or the no, it's the male latches onto a female. So I think I think that speaks to the point of uh, when when there's a you know, not a lot of you around and when there's it's complete darkness there's not a lot of I mean obviously they have some sensory um, ways of finding each other. It's but uh, long distances, few few entities. They they find ways to uh, to get overcome that hurdle. So Travis, here's another question for you in the chat. Um, they're asking if they've remembered correctly that corals have had multiple extinction type events and been respawned several times from deep sea corals. Yeah. So. Corals, uh, at least modern reef development, has been around for about 225 million years. And uh, this has been sort of 
there's been a couple really interesting events. Um, uh. There's been some corals that were thought to have lost their calcium carbonate skeletons during periods of really low pH. Uh, and then when the pH of the ocean increased again uh, over you know, geologic timescales, they're you know, bringing those skeletons back. So uh, this button here. And one of the things we're seeing right now, for example, with uh, the current uh, rates of ocean warming, we see lots of leaching of corals in the shallowest depths. And so we've been losing a lot of our shallow water corals. And a lot of folks are looking at not necessarily deep sea, but mesophotic uh, corals. So around 100, 150 meters depth as potential refugia uh, for some of these corals in shallower places. And so um, certainly throughout geologic time, there's been uh, pauses and returns of extensive reef building throughout the tropics. And one of the really big concerns right now is more so that we're losing a lot of coral dominated reef systems. And you know this is really a, a human problem because yeah. we as humans depend on the, the construction and maintenance of reefs for a lot of services. So things like shoreline protection and fisheries. Um, and so these are the things that, you know, from a conservation standpoint, we're really focusing on trying to maintain. Uh, and of course, we want to maintain as many corals as possible too. Um, but certainly something that's been around for 225 million years is... Uh, Has some resilience yes. to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, for those of you at home, some of us are stepping on out to go get a quick dinner break, but we'll be right back with you. So we have other, I have Devin here who's going to be taking over for me for a few minutes. Hi everyone, this is Devin. I am going to relieve Daniela so she can go grab some dinner. Follow along on this watch. You've seen some, some things. I was excited. I was downstairs when we saw the uh, giant mammoth tusk slash wood. <laughs> the tree. <laughs> that, that was an exciting moment, and then it turned into a tree. Oh, what is that? Like, oh. We got an eel. We got an eel. Very yeah. cool. Not as cool as the viper eel. <laughs> no. It's pretty long, that one. Mm-hmm. We got some more, here's some more of that, you know, lava flow in the geological. Yeah, so we've been seeing this sort of throughout the formation. We started at the bottom of this uh, seamount today and we've been cruising towards the top and it's been interspersed with these lava dikes. So these are sort of cracks that have opened up that um, the magma has flowed into and cooled and we're left with these uh, really striking found, uh, rock bodies that are really resistant to weathering. And as we've been cruising up today, we've been seeing lots of organisms sort of flocking onto um, this hard structure and uh, a lot of them actually sort of hanging out on the corners, pretty interesting. This seems to be a major driver of, of habitat, sort of refuge from, from sediment. So um, just now and sort of throughout the day, every time we see one of these, it's been pretty heavily populated with, with crinoids and some corals, so pretty I was going to say, cool. it looks like they're doing pretty well in this area.
For those of you watching, remember our chat line is open. If you have any questions, please feel free to send us those. We'd love to give you some feedback. Nine ten. Uh, is there any way you guys can fly a little lower for the cameras? Uh, about five meters. And uh, continue up as fast as you can. Roger, yeah, ship is uh, ship is moving. We are. Thank you. We are going along. That'll help. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Jonathan, is there a reason uh, port cam on Triclops is off? Okay, just note that. Wow, really. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Striking feature there, that dike. Yeah. Saw Sea Star as well back there. Yeah. Yeah, that one looked like it had a little bit of an orangish color. Wonderful. Might be seeing some more corals around. Another eel. There's an there's another eel. Oh yeah, same as before. This little ridge sort of stacking out. And again we can see the uh, do you want the lasers on for this? This rock creating habitat for everything. Too short. Is that a little tube? What's that? No. Oh. No. Uh, Dan? Is that you, Dan? Or is Simon? Simon. Uh, Simon. Dan, Dan's uh, up here. Or Dan? Yeah. Diamond. Yeah. Can we uh, <laughs> do a laser? A uh, good spot for a lasers whenever you see it? Thank you. Um, I don't know. We just lost the SSP stream for that stereo cam, so I'm trying to sneak out to see if I can get a Rachel. Oh, you're okay. Uh, the camera's still functioning. It's just uh, oh, it's the, the visual. Just the loss of visual. Okay. The MJPEG stream works. All right, that ship moves complete. I'm going to continue up, if that's all right. Catch up with you a little bit. Bridge nav. Bay Oriole, three zero meters, bearing two seven zero. Thank you. And someone posted in. They're starting to get into biology. Woo! -hoo always that fun part which that's what you were looking for right just to get a good glimpse of the amount of life that's been stationed here getting themselves settled yeah so we've been sort of keeping our eyes on those uh, as we've been moving up slope throughout the day um, and yeah basically every every major rock outcrop we've seen uh, pretty good covering uh, of different organisms on that and one of the things that we'll be doing after the cruise is trying to see uh, yeah, how have those communities changed as we move up slope. So going in a little bit more detail and uh, more quantitative um, to yeah, say what exactly has been, been going on and try to come up with some potential hypotheses to explain that. Here we have, uh, not sure if those are big ophiorites or Are they urchins? Urchins, yeah. Yeah, urchins. Urchins, crinoids. Is someone wanting to know what the distance between the lasers, those two points are, and how do we use them for measurement? So it's 10 centimeters. Sounds and, great. And then when we look at the images, so we're going to be reconstructing uh, any of our models, we can measure the distance between the two points in the image and then we can say that many pixels is 10 centimeters and then we can essentially count any number of pixels 
and then we, we'll use our pixels to centimeters conversion to say how big things are. Yeah. Math. So, pretty useful tool to have. Yes. Uh, allows us to get nice uh, quick checks on our, our scaling, especially if we want to measure uh, particular things of interest. There you go, find Rachel. Lots of softer sediments up here. Uh, although, looks uh, like maybe some more rock features on the way from the, the ROV sonar. So we'll see what, what shakes out. What's that? Ah, oh, we can turn the laser off. Um, right now it's a little tough with uh, a lot of the soft sediment, so we we'll want to be, you know, moving up as try to find more hard substrates. Hey, uh, Dan. Uh, yeah. Do you need? What do you need? I oh, let me just speak to the front row there. Yeah, there you go. Hey, Dan. got a shout out to Dr. Ballard, everyone else involved for the work that you have done to make deep sea exploration so much more diverse and accessible. Much love from our family to you all. Couldn't agree more with that. Such amazing opportunities, discoveries. Ship's got a few meters left, but I'll hold up there and we'll, we'll wait for the next one. Camera reset. Is that a coral or an urchin? Looks like a...
<laughs> yeah, but that, most of that was early on, you know. <laughs> most of that was early on. <laughs> Like Hark is riding right above the seafloor. Great, great video. The clarity in these cameras is amazing. How often do you encounter <coughs> trash or pollution? Far too often, if you ask me. In fact, our first dive, that was one of the first things that we came across. Wasn't sure what it was until we zoomed <laughs> in and got a look at a can. Bud Light can. Bud Light can, <laughs> circa 1986. It's unfortunate that we do do tend to find it. The currents move in a lot, dropping things off along the way. Yeah, and that's only the plastics they actually see. There's also microplastics that yes. are being um, deposited down in the depths too. Got that. Yeah, and Devin, to add to that answer, um, the, actually on the island of Hawaii, there's a beach down near the south end, kind of where we're at, that um, it's called Camilo Beach. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, it's become the nickname of Trash Beach because there's just so much trash in that region. So um, whether we're seeing it down here, uh, we see it washed up on shore quite a bit. Um, we just happen to be in the kind of the perfect gyre across the Pacific where things end up um, on our beaches in that way. So. So we have less than 100 meters to go, I believe, and we're not seeing the same um, topographic complexity that we were seeing at the base. Very interesting. Um, so the soft corals and I um, can't, can't remember the other name of the other things there, but they're just latching on to whatever substrate they can't find.
Hello everyone, this is Daniela back from dinner. We had some awesome ratatouille for dinner today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, this is to Zach, um, you know how you're talking about the uh, trash beach. Um, in Puerto Rico, we're having a lot of issues with um, pollution and trash uh, to the effect that some of our bioluminescent bays that we have out of the five in the world, we have three of them. They're beginning to diminish in, in specific areas because of the uh, um, coastal development. Okay, watch change in video. Penel coming in. That's so terrible to hear because I love seeing the bioluminescence. It's one of my favorite phenomenons that we have out on the ocean. Oh, have you seen them before? Um, not in Puerto Rico. I haven't been to Puerto Rico, but I've definitely gone diving in um, other parts of the world. Out of Catalina Island, we used to do night dives, and you could just, like, wave your hands, and it was really beautiful. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> something I haven't experienced for myself. It actually wasn't until this dive, uh, I think it was the first dive we did while I was on here, that we 